Welcome back to the BanderPod, the prosaic and poetic podcast of Bandersnatch Books. We're a small press publisher of treasures found off the beaten path for lovers of all that is good, true, and beautiful. I'm Rachel Donahue, and today I'll be your host as we're talking with poet Jen Rose Yokel about poetry, spirituality, and community. Jen is the author of Beneath the Flood, a collection of observational poetry named after the prose poem that anchors the collection. Beneath the Flood was published by Bandersnatch Books in 2023 and is available at bandersnatchbooks.com slash store or through your favorite bookseller. Jen Rose Yokel, welcome to the Banderpod. Nice. Good to be here. Always look forward to our chats and yeah. um, especially when they involve poetry. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. I'm I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, first things first, introduce our listeners who may not be familiar with your poetry to your collections Beneath the Flood and Ruins and Kingdoms. What can they expect from your poetry collections? Ruins and Kingdoms was my first book that I self-published in 2015. Mm -hmm. It's a very distinct period Mm -hmm. of my life. I haven't looked at it in a while. I should probably go look and see, <laughs> is this good or is this cringe? I don't know. Yeah. No, <laughs> there there are some gems in there for sure. I definitely enjoyed it when I read it. Ah, thank you. I appreciate that. And then Beneath the Flood, I say you could expect, some people have pointed out that they feel like sometimes the poems start off a little lighthearted and funny and then they catch you off guard. That's what people have been telling me, so... That's what I hope for, like kind of that Billy Collins-ish plot twist, kind of. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Your poetry is very accessible. It's not, I mean, it stays in the concrete world for Mm -hmm. the most part, but definitely looks very closely at our reality to see the deeper truths, the spiritual reality that is also present, just kind of beneath that veil, kind of just peeling back and helping us see a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. There are definitely some that have that turn that is like, Oh man, that line. I wish I had written that line. (laughs) So your husband, Chris, is a poet as well. Two poets. (laughs) Tell me what that's like. Yeah, I think it might have been like one of the things that our friendship kind of built on. Like we met Mm -hmm. many folks. If you're listening to the Banderpod, then you're probably at least tangentially familiar with the Rabbit Room and Hutch Moot and all that. And that's the community where Chris and I met. And I think we just sort of like bonded over poetry I love that yeah it's kind of cool to have somebody who like understands this weird thing that you write (laughs) and that we kind of support each other we don't really collaborate a lot Mm -hmm. other than starting like an online poetry group that we've Mm -hmm. collaborated on I think yeah he's currently working on a new collection so I've had a chance to read through that and like hear some of what he's thinking and what's going on with that. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. We have books all over our house. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So Jen, would you take a moment and read some of Beneath the Flood for us? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, let's let's do the title poem. Yeah, so I'd love to. This is the title poem Beneath the Flood. One, I was six years old the day I decided to go under. So small and new to the bright mystery of living, all I knew was the tug of a question. Why wait? I don't remember her voice or exact words, but I remember the teacher's permed hair and the essence of a question. Do you want to ask Jesus to live in your heart? I thought I knew him anyway, but still my small hand went up. Thursdays were chapel days, boys in ties, girls in dresses, and those that said yes gathered, nervous, backstage, ready to be baptized before the adults. That one kid in class, the one with freckles and crooked teeth who was always knocking me into the playground dirt, said she'll freak when she goes underwater, knowing I was fearful and shy. I didn't freak. I don't remember the preacher's face or name, but I remember the old strong hands laying young life into death. I remember cold water in a blue plastic tub behind the altar, my hair floating around as I descended. I remember a moment of hovering like a spirit under the waters before I rose. Two, I've seen babies marked with holy water. They lie there, small and fragile in the hands of the preacher before the eyes of family and extended family they have yet to meet. I always wonder if they'll cry when their brow is splashed, but they don't. 
They lie there in one strong hand while another gentle hand, cupped and dripping, pours the water over them. And the old sanctuary breaks open with joy. The morning light bends through stained glass and the gathered family marvels at new life made newer. I wonder at the calm in these children. I wonder if they stay content because they know a secret I've long forgotten. Perhaps they're still used to swimming in something liquid and holy. And here at the dawn of life, before sorrow has the chance to touch them, before they know heartbreak, loneliness, and longing, the mark of water can't burn them yet. We have sinned and grown old, but they are young and remember. Three. I've seen my niece's ocean baptism, watched as she and a preacher waded waist deep in the Atlantic. Family by blood, by marriage, and by faith gather in the harsh wind and watch a cold wave off the rocky Massachusetts coast sweep over her teenage body. The ocean has an urgency. It gives and takes and gives again. I wonder if it feels different from my swim in the baptistry. I wonder if it feels even more like descending into death, into the first element, into the silt of creation. The seawater churns around the world, catching the remnants of rocks, the ashes of those gone before, mixing with the salt of tears and the memory of those lost at sea. She rises, fist in the air, victorious. She is shining as she's wrapped in a towel. And here we gather in joy at the edge of a turbulent mystery, a people wandering a wide, dangerous world. Maybe we're all lost at sea, swept out into the churning waves of time, waiting to be recalled again to life. Four. I've seen women who've heard the whisper, why wait? They've passed through pain and been led by the hand to the house of God, and we'd cheer as we watch them pledge themselves to a new lover. They've known too much life, these beautiful women. They've felt the crust of addiction on their skin, felt shame hang like a millstone around their necks, felt the hound of heaven's breath on their backs as he pursues, shakes the earth to reach them. I wonder how they got so brave. I wonder at the terrors they've seen or how compelling the light must have been. They plunge into the water, then rise up in joy, feeling cleaner and younger than ever. Their burdens dissolve like salt in the sea. Their hair drips with glory. Now they walk lighter, floating across the room like so many Cinderella's clothed in radiant white. Oh, daughters, you look so beautiful. You stride unashamed into the castle, into the dance, the feast. And the music stops and every head turns when you enter. Daughters once dead, now alive. Daughters once lost, now found. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That's beautiful. So Chris's day job is, is teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Like he yes. teaches writing and poetry and things like that, but your day job doesn't necessarily have to do with writing no, poetry, but there's really, some overlap. Yeah. So tell people, tell people about your day job. What's, what's your gig right now? And then how that overlaps with poetry. Started using the language of there's the day job, the day job that like pays you. <laughs> and that is weirdly working HR payroll at a small business, mm -hmm. like at a, for a design company, which has been really fun experience. I've been learning things that I did not know about tax codes. And <laughs> that's, that's very strange, but it's also kind of cool to participate in a team and just get glimpses into other industries. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a branding agency. So I get to not only learn about the work that my designer friends do, but then I get to learn about the different industries we work in. That maybe doesn't overlap with the poetry a ton other than I can write really concise Instagram captions because <laughs> I manage our social media. That's um, great. That is a skill, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, so there's my day job. What I would consider my vocation hmm. in addition to poetry is I'm a spiritual director. For listeners who aren't familiar with that terminology, yeah. kind of unpack what that involves. So spiritual direction is a very it's a very old practice most of the major religious traditions have some version of this i'm practicing in the contemplative christian tradition mm -hmm. and a spiritual director is not quite a counselor or a therapist but kind of doing similar work a spiritual director 
our work is more like attuned to what's going on at the soul level. So hmm. usually you, you just sitting with somebody and you're just really kind of being a friend and a companion to help make sense of what God is doing in their lives and just kind of listens with you in prayerful mm -hmm. attention to your life and to what's going on. Yeah. All right. So I'm hearing words like attention and noticing discernment. These things have to do with the process of writing poetry. So mm -hmm. can you kind of unpack, these are, these are the same skills and you're using them in both areas. Talk, talk to me about that overlap. Simone Weil has this quote, attention, she says, taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. And hmm. I hear that idea come up in even like poet Mary Oliver's work that what we pay attention to is almost kind of like honoring and elevating it. And that's what I consider happening hmm. when I write poetry. So, I mean, I have this little tiny short poem about grocery stores because I was in the checkout line buying my apples, not really thinking about it. And the cashier was just like, oh my gosh, look at these little apples. They're so great. And I think, oh, wow, her <laughs> attention to the beauty of this fruit and how that tied into the season was kind of deserving of some honor. And then out comes a poem. I think in the work of spiritual direction, we kind of do that. Mm -hmm. Somebody may just kind of make an offhand comment about a feeling they had or maybe a question they're wrestling with, and they might have some sort of insight and it's like, okay, yes, let's call that out. Let's spend some time just exploring that. Let's make space to be attentive to that. Spiritual directors are just kind of professional listeners, yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really good. This, these are good overlapping practices. I was listening to a podcast mm -hmm. recently and heard the poem Malcolm Geit quoting one of Seamus Haney's poems mm -hmm. where he says, read poems as prayers. And talking about how poetry and being a priest are like intertwined mm. in his life because they're both spiritual practices. And so it really has kind of shaped my own practice of writing poetry yeah. as almost like a spiritual discipline that when I am paying attention, it is this posture of receiving, of not yeah. forcing my ideas onto the thing, but of listening and paying attention to what is God trying to teach me through? Like, what are the impressions that the spirit is leading me in the thing that captures my attention in this moment? Mm -hmm. So in thinking about writing poetry as a spiritual discipline, I'm curious what poems, either ones that you've written or ones that you've read, have brought you closer to God or brought a moment of clarity or insight that you might not have had otherwise? Hmm. that was a good question so one poet who has really done this for me a lot lately is Rilke the German poet I just love how he uses interesting metaphors for God that kind of shift my perspective I have this collection called prayers of a young poet this was a translation of some of his, like just early drafts of his famous like Book of Hours poems. And they were just inspired by his experiences seeing the Orthodox Church and being really moved. And there's this one poem that begins with the lines, You neighbor God, when I sometimes wake you with loud knocks in the long nights, I do so because I rarely hear you breathing. And there's a line, this wall is built from your paintings and they stand before you like names. And when the light flames in me and claims you in my deep, it squanders itself as radiance upon their frames. And I think that strikes me as a poet and as a spiritual director, because I think mm -hmm. that just makes me recognize we're all kind of grasping at knowing God and describing God these different images and icons and poems that we create our efforts to get to know God and get to mentally grasp what he's like. That whole book was really great as a spiritual practice. So yeah, he's, he's a great one. 
and Wendell Berry. I like, I just love his Sabbath poems. I love um, practice resurrection. Yes. <laughs> it's the past few weeks I've had the line, like the refrain running through my head of that we may reap great work is done while we're asleep. Mm. And so, uh, you know, and he's talking about that a Sabbath mood might rest on our work. And it's like that line, yeah. you can just, it goes so deep, mm-hmm. you know, it takes the spiritual truth and it applies it in such a way that just awakens something and mm-hmm. gives you more to meditate on and more to yeah. think on. And like all these different scriptures come to mind that's drawing yeah. from these, these deep truths. And that's, that's good stuff. It's profound. It's taking, it's stripping away that veil of that was in the film of familiarity and, mm-hmm. and helping us really see. And it sounds like that's what the purpose of spiritual direction is as well Mm -hmm. to kind of help you peel back and help you really look at the decision or whatever it is that to see it from another angle or to see it with more clarity to really get to kind of the heart of the heart of the matter. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think you, you don't know what you don't know. You don't always know. And I feel like that's a lot of the work is protecting the space mm. and creating like kind of a hospitable space to just process and to just be with God and to be still and listen. Mm. And yeah, that's what I, and I hope that's what I want to do with my poetry too. I just would like to create these like kind of like micro hospitable mm. places. I love that. Yeah. I feel like you do that, how to be hospitable and invite a reader into a moment or into a scene mm-hmm. and help them to see with the eyes of love. I'm thinking in particular about one of your poems, the of the girls on the the Metro North train, right? Oh yeah. And it has oh I'm gonna butcher the line. Please read it. Okay. The funny thing about the girl to the girls on the Metro North train was that poem like almost didn't make the cut. <laughs> I kept looking at it and thinking, is this weird? Is this wrong? Is this like not a good fit for this collection so i feel like that's the one that people keep telling me oh man i love that one i'm yeah. like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah to the girls on the metro north train forgive me for eavesdropping but your joy was so loud you were laughing and taking photos propping boot clad feet on the armrest a merry band of travelers and one of you talked about your posture chiding yourself to sit up straight commenting on your layers of fat no said your friend You've got muscle. You're beautiful. You looked in your phone's selfie camera, grinned brightly, shared a hug. I don't know if this was your first time to the city or a regular trip you make. I hope when the world calls you names and tries to dampen your joy, tells you not to laugh so loud, tells you the things you love are meaningless. Oh, dear girls, wherever you are, I hope you remember how it feels to be wholly yourself and alive. Hmm. Love that. But that pardon me, but your joy was so loud. Like it's just such a generous view of the world, of other people. And yeah, you definitely see that that crossover between prayer and poetry. And so spiritual direction is something you're doing in community with another person, but you've also mm-hmm. done a lot of poetry in community with other people. Mm. And honestly, like that's where I kind of got my start. So talk a little bit about that poetry community and kind of how that's grown and shaped. Chris and I have been involved with the Rabbit Room for over a decade and have been attending the Hutchmook Conference. One year they asked us if we would host a poetry open mic and they were like, we don't know if people are going to show up, but will you at least try it? And so we were like, yeah, sure. I think this is probably like 2017, 2018, something like that. Yeah, 2017, yeah. 2017. Okay. And it was wonderful. Like so many people showed up. You were there. Yeah, that was the first time I had ever read my poetry aloud before a group before. Yeah. It was in 2017. That was momentous. <laughs> yeah. It was so great. And I just remember leaving that room like overjoyed, like, oh my gosh, there's other poets here. We're not the yes. only ones. <laughs> And we've been doing that annually since then, and even just versions of that during COVID when we were online. So we created a Facebook group called the Poetry Mm. Pub and just kind of, and I feel like the Poetry Pub has sort of taken on a life of its own. We've published a few digital chapbooks. Our good friends, JJ Brinsky and Sarah Spradlin are hosting like regular open mics on Zoom Mm -hmm. 
And it's just been so cool to see this very generous down to earth community of poets like rise up and just so many have like published books. You published a couple books mm -hmm. out of that. I just think it's so cool that people have gotten behind it and it's just kind of kept going. I mean, actually, if anybody is listening, if you are on Facebook and yeah. you are a poet in April and October, we opened the group up to new members and you can like send a request to join mm -hmm. and then... Well, we close the new membership just so we can spend some time nurturing community, mm -hmm. help it grow slowly. It's so much fun. And there's so many yeah. good things coming out of it. I mean, I'm just overwhelmed every time. And a lot of the spiritual overlap that we're talking about, mm -hmm. a lot of prayerful things, a lot of things that have grown out of deep meditation or, or paying very close attention to the world. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I've got um, some popcorn questions oh, to throw at you. Fun. <laughs> so feel free to make these short answer. Okay. All right. What's your favorite word? Oh, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Kerfuffle. <laughs> oh, that's fun. All right. Your next task is to use it in a poem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Noted. <laughs> for, for, an, for another day. Yeah. You, can, you can come back to me with that one. <laughs> What are your favorite tools of the trade? Step one, either a black wing pencil or a mm -hmm. one of these like Sharpie S gel pens. Oh, yeah. Step two, Scrivener. Mm -hmm. Goodness, I will sing the praises of Scrivener forever. Mm -hmm. I have a document with like 10 years worth of poems. Yep. I actually finally converted Chris to Scrivener a couple of years ago. <laughs> he was just doing it like a Google Doc and I'm like, there's another way. There's a better way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. All right. Here's a tough question. Who's your all-time favorite poet? All-time favorite. Let's say either Wendell Berry or Rilke. Can mm -hmm. I do that? Sure. Why not? Nobody can answer with just one, right? All right. Nobody can answer with just one. <laughs> My current favorite, though, I'm like on a Ada Limon kick mm. right now reading one of her collections she's great well my next question was what is a favorite poem you've read this year so can you name like give us one of ada limon's poems that you've really enjoyed give me this by ada limon from her new book the hurting kind all right one for us to explore and then last question so our tagline is publishing treasures found off the beaten path so name a poet off the beaten path that you think people should read mm -hmm. Maybe somebody lesser known. Somebody lesser known. Shout out to my poetry mm. pub friends. Chris Wheeler has published a couple of like really wonderful books and you guys should check him out. And JJ Brinsky just launched a Kickstarter campaign for his sci-fi poetry yes. and micro fiction book. And I've, I've read like an early draft of it and it is yes. utterly delightful and weird. Yeah, I actually just backed his Kickstarter. Yeah. It just launched. So if you're hearing this, um, yeah, definitely check out. <laughs> if you are JJ's listening work. to this within like the month or so of it coming out, yeah, definitely check that out because yeah. I think that's going to be a good time. I think so too. Very cool. Definitely off the beaten path. <laughs> yes. And I love right. science fiction. So it all yes. like, works. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a good overlap for sure. Oh, well, Jen, thank you so much for joining us on the Vanderpod. It's always a joy to get to chat with you. Always a pleasure, you guys. <laughs> we appreciate all you do, Jen. Thanks. May you find bookish treasures in your wanderings off the beaten path. Thanks for listening in to our conversation today on the Vanderpod. We hope you'll check out our full catalog at bandersnatchbooks.com. The Banderpod is produced by Rachel S. Donahue, A.B. Donahue, and Carolyn Claire Givens. Audio engineering by S.D.G. Morgan. Artwork by Evelyn Warnemundy. Many thanks to our friend Chris Slayton of Son of Laughter for our theme song, Cricket in a Jar. Find links and more in the show notes.